about trains. Tonight, hop aboard the This Week East Coast Express. We've been virgin on the ridiculous, but at last we found the man who can save Britain's trains from hitting the buffers. I'm afraid not, Andrew. I'm just the slim controller. <whistles> Giles Brandreth will be travelling first class. Where else? I'm on the 0159 to Windsor, Andrew. The train is running very late. I've got a big event to attend and a political roundup to do. And what's more, the buffet is closed. Is the Middle East peace process well and truly off the rails? Dan Hodges is letting off some steam. The Gaza shootings were a tragedy, but people are wrong to blame Israel. And railing against bad manners and a lack of courtesy in politics. Made in Chelsea's Olivia Bentley is at the end of the line. This week, I've got off at the wrong stop. Hold on tightly. We've got a day return to Windsor, a bottle of Blue Nun. It's dark out there, but we're wearing nationalised sunglasses. So let's get a chuffin' move on. Good evening all, welcome to This Week, live from Westminster and dead from the neck up. In light of the sad news that Meghan Markle's father is too ill to attend Saturday's royal wedding, I have offered to step into the breach and give away Ms Markle myself. It's yet further proof of my commitment to public service, and you know I believe in public service, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this muck at such an ungodly hour every Thursday night. Besides, it's my last best hope of getting an invitation to the wedding. In fact, I offered to give away the whole royal family, but was advised there would be no takers. Which surprised me, since those of us who've flirted with republicanism in the past have reluctantly had to admit it's become something of a lost cause in recent years. First it was William and Kate, now it's Harry and Meghan, the new Fab Four of our age, who, between them, seem to have guaranteed the monarchy well into the 21st century. <clears throat> of course, there's still Charles and Camilla, our only hopes. But even they seem to be pretty popular these days. So we'll probably have to throw in the towel and admit defeat. Symbolically, we'll use a tea towel with the Queen's head on it. Speaking of causes for which we've lost all hope and for whom popularity has always been an alien concept, I'm joined on the sofa tonight by the Meghan and Markle of late night political discourse. I speak, of course, of Liz hashtag 4% Kendall. You see what I mean by popularity. And Michael hashtag or even hashtag. Choo Choo Pertillo. And in honor of the impending nuptials, hashtag Jimmy the Corgi has decided to grace us with his presence. He's en route to Windsor, naturally. Michael, your moment of the week. Um, I think the select committee reports into Carillion, the very large company that collapsed, that does a lot of government contracts. Mm. And the, um, the select committees pretty much accuse the management of driving the company off a cliff. While making a fortune themselves. While making a fortune themselves. Um, they uh, really uh, think there was aggressive accounting uh, mismanagement. And they also blame the big four accountancy firms. And interestingly, all four of the big four are involved in Korean <laughs> one way or yeah. another, which rather makes the point. The, the sad thing about this is that people always say that these collapses are a watershed moment. They never proved to be a watershed moment because there's always another crisis. And if Jeremy Corbyn is elected prime minister and does, I think, terrible damage to the British economy, then these people who claim to have been uh, capitalists, they don't understand capitalism, will be the people who will be to blame. Interesting. There's your moment of the week. The death of Tessa Jell. Of course. Um, who really was a wonderful woman. Had, had been on this programme. Yes, and it was just... Um, listening to all the tributes in the Commons was both heartbreaking and uplifting. Mm. No, not just because of all of her achievements, but because of who she was as a person. You know, positive, optimistic, funny and kind. Always a smile. And Pete Kyle, the MP for Hove, said... To have somebody with such Olympic vision who mm. made it happen and yet 
did doing so, leaving a trail of nothing but love and laughter, yeah. really, um, really, I think, hit the nail on the head, and she will be very sadly missed. She will indeed. Thank you for that. For Israel, it should have been a week of double celebration, winning the Eurovision Song Contest, even though when I last looked at a map, it isn't even part of Europe, and welcoming the symbolic move of the US Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and popular even with America's allies and provocative for the rest of the Middle East, but widely welcomed by most Israelis as cementing the ancient city as the country's capital. Everything, however, was overshadowed by the chaos and carnage on Israel's border with Gaza, as the Palestinians protested and the Israeli Defence Force responded with deadly firepower. Sixty Palestinians were shot dead, almost 3,000 wounded from tear gas, shrapnel and gunfire. Many legs were amputated. The world recoiled at the slaughter and largely condemned it. Israel said Hamas, that's the hardline grouping which runs Gaza and doesn't recognize Israel's right to exist, he said that Hamas had attempted a 40,000-strong invasion of protesters, many armed, with the aim of attacking Jewish communities close to the fence, which separates Gaza from Israel. So it had the right to defend its territory using all necessary force. But many were still left wondering why sophisticated and well-trained forces could not deal with hostile crowds and serious unrest without resorting to mass casualties. Here's journalist Dan Hodges with his Tick of the Week. Thousands of miles away from the front line, it's very easy to form assumptions and make accusations. A popular narrative one often prosecuted without analysis is that Israel is a brutal pariah state existing on the oppression and subjugation of the Palestinian people. Again this week, we've seen Israel blamed for the bloodshed on its border with Gaza. But in reality, the Israeli government has simply been trying to defend its citizens and its territory, just as we would expect the British government to defend us if we were under attack. Yes, Donald Trump's decision to move the US Embassy to Jerusalem was unnecessarily provocative, but Hamas have used that and Israel's 70th anniversary to exploit tensions. The so-called protest alongside the border fence wasn't peaceful. Hamas operatives were armed with guns, with knives and with bombs. And their stated intention was to enter Israel and kill. I'll ask this question. If the Israeli security forces had allowed Hamas to successfully breach the border, what do people think would have happened next? The reality is Hamas remains committed to the destruction of Israel. I've visited an Israeli kibbutz close to that border fence. One of the residents told me how a farmer had been ploughing his field when his tractor fell into a giant hole. When the tractor was pulled out, they found a nearly completed Hamas tunnel. Then they searched the surrounding area and found a second tunnel, which was 100 yards from the local infant school. Terrorists have crossed that border and terrorists have murdered Israeli citizens. Faced with that reality, it's not surprising that Israeli troops opened fire with live rounds. Any innocent death is a tragedy, but it's a tragedy whose responsibility rests first and foremost with Hamas. And Dan Hodges is with us now. Welcome. Okay. Now, even if Hamas was behind the protests, and I think the evidence is clear that it was, uh, even if some of the protesters were armed and dangerous, and the evidence is that some were, still wasn't the Israeli response disproportionate? 
Not if you think about what the reaction would have been if the border fence had been breached. I mean, as I said, I mean, Hamas were, were very explicit about what their intention was. They wanted to breach the border fence because they then wanted to infiltrate their fighters into the, and their terrorists into those But if they had done that, they could then have been taken on by Israeli anti-riot forces, but, which would instead... Israel use snipers. But you still. How could you use snipers against protesters? Well, I mean, you're, you're, you're saying protesters, but the point is these were not protests. This was not a demonstration. This was a coordinated, specific attempt to breach the fence with the, with the aim of then entering those communities and then murdering people within those communities. And Hamas but, were, were, were but completely that wasn't open about the intention. There were some. Hamas had seeded people among them. It's an old no, technique. Hamas... I, I grant you all that. But I, I guess, I mean, snipers against even this kind of dangerous protest seems unusual for a democracy. And, and surely a democracy faced with serious social unrest, surely it has to learn how to handle that without resorting to mass fatalities. Well, I mean, I'm... we learned the hard way with Bloody Sunday, didn't well, we? Well, no, but that's the point. I mean, that's the point I was going to say. I mean, you say it, it, it's unusual for democracy. Un unfortunately, we have right. a history within our own society. Which has of, haunted of, of us ever since. Well, it has, but obviously the situation in, 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 in the situation in Gaza, as I said, the reality is what were the options available to the Israeli security forces? The water cannon, rubber bullets aren't effective. They're only really effective at close range. And as I said, the intention was to breach the fence with the intention of murdering Israeli civilians. What do you say to Dan's argument, Liz? I said nobody is denying Israel's right to, you know, defend its borders and defend itself against terrorism, but it doesn't give them the right to fire on unarmed citizens. I mean, hundreds of children were injured. And you're right, Andrew, I believe it was completely disproportionate. But Hamas has uh, admitted that 50 of the 60 killed were Hamas militants. And as I've said, defending yourself against terrorists, no, nobody's denying that. But that's the it's ones they killed. The, hu the hundreds of children who were injured and thousand more uh, why would people you who take, were protesting. Why would you take a child to a protest like that? Because I think many people who were there, I'm not denying that Hamas has manipulated this for its own ends, mm. but many people were there genuinely protesting against the appalling situation in Gaza. And my fear of all of this is that we're in this <coughs> death cycle of despair and the lack of leadership from both Israel and the Palestinians means that Israel, innocent Israelis and Palestinians are suffering. But I think, I, I think you know, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with the sort of the, the, the lack of leadership on all sides in, in, in regards to the, the, the general situation. But in relation to that specific incident, uh, incident and that specific security threat, and sorry to, to come back to this, as I said, it, it, it wasn't a protest. This was, these were not people who were simply protesting about the, Many the, the were Palestinians. Down. No, but, but, but the point is... And more broadly, I would say what has disappointed me enormously about Israeli policy for the last 10 or 20 years has been the settlements policy. Because settling land that was taken over after the 1967 war makes any two-state solution virtually impossible. These are on the West Bank settlements. And, and the reason that there have been uh, an increasing number of settlements which have complicated it so much is that Israeli politics uh, are dictated by the most extreme parties. Mm -hmm. Because under their electoral system, the most extreme parties get pretty strong representation in Parliament, even if their, uh, their popular vote is quite small. And Israel continues to attract, as immigrants, militants, particularly from the United States, who are more and more pushing Israeli policy 
towards these extremes, say that there are many Israelis, I mean, possibly even a majority of Israelis, who are quite shocked by a lot of Israeli mm -hmm. policy. The, the peace process is effectively dead. Mm. Uh, the Palestinian cause is um, in decline, even in the Middle East. Maybe the Israelis just think they can do what they want now. Well, no, I mean, if you look at the response from the Israeli security forces, I mean, picking up the point that Michael's made, I mean, they have accepted that in PR terms, this has been a disaster. I mean, they've openly, they've openly accepted that. But what, what, what they've argued as well is they, they are not in a position when they have the integrity of Israeli t territory threatened and, crucially, Israeli lives under threat in this way to look at a broader picture. They, their primary responsibility has to be to prevent loss of life when, when, when they are facing attack, direct attack, as Hamas has admitted, but they, from a but terrorist they, organization. They didn't prevent loss of life. They killed 60 people and injured 3,000 no, uh, others. No, obviously, and, 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 you know, the loss of one innocent life is, is obviously, as I said, a tragedy. But as you pointed out, from Hamas's own admission, the majority, the vast majority of those that were killed were Hamas's own operatives. See, I wonder where we're going here and that this is going to happen again and again now. Because the Palestinian cause is now in retreat. The West Bank didn't rise up in protest about what had happened in Gaza. The rest of the Arab world, which I'm following very carefully, mm. the response was surprisingly mute. Uh, and all Hamas has done is it's turned, helped to turn Gaza into a hellhole, uh, and it's nowhere to go. Well. There's no, there's no progress, there's no both possible Hamas, light both, at the end of this tunnel. Both Hamas and Israel ha have indeed uh, turned Gaza into a hellhole, but the problem seems to me, following up on what you were saying about uh, appealing to extremists, um, I think that's what Israel is doing, but also the you know, the, the US has appealed, you know, Trump's moving the embassy to Jerusalem was also about appealing to his hard right evangelical Christians, when really I think the only hope for getting any movement towards a two state solution, which I still believe is the only viable option, is to work with the neighbouring Arab countries. And this is what really strikes me about, about Trump's move. Um, it's not only weakened their influence in the peace process, it's not only weakened the case of people who are arguing for negotiation over violence, it's weakened the, the ability of countries like Saudi Arabia to form any kind of alliance or working relationship with Israel right. to curb the expansion of so, Iran Saudi in the Arabia area. When, when, is Israel's new ally. When, when, when people say uh, Gaza is a hellhole, I mean, half a point, half a percentage of the oil wealth of Saudi Arabia would enrich everyone in Gaza and give them all the services they wanted, all the hospitals, all the schools. The fact is that Saudi Arabia and other Arab states are not interested in helping the people of Gaza, um, possibly because they don't agree with their political position, but probably also because it quite uh, suits them to have this running saw that makes a villain of Israel on an almost daily basis. See, I, I would put it uh, to you, Dan, moving on from the actual incident itself mm. and trying to see it in, in a broader context. The, the, the two-state peace process Liz is talking about, that's yesterday's politics. It's over now. It's gone. There's been not a scintilla of progress towards it. And while that rigor mortis has set in, it's the rise of Iran is the regional threat now to Israel and to Sunni Arab states. And the Palestinians have been sidelined in this because the tacit Israeli-Saudi alliance is now the new dynamic in the region. It's, it's changed from the way it's been for the past 40 years. It, it is. I mean, but if you speak to people in, people in Israel, I mean, one of the things that, that they are obviously terrified of in relation, in, in relation to Iran, and in particular in relation to the Iran nuclear threat, is you have yes. a situation where, where, where actually there is almost an Iranian... Uh, an Iranian nuclear umbrella thrown over the Gaza Strip and... and, 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 and but and, in and that, that standoff, the but Saudis and other Sunni states are closer to Israel than they are to the Palestinians. That's, no, I mean, that's, that's absolutely right. But, I mean, I think, I, I think the, you know, the broader problem... I mean, this is where I would agree with, with, with some of the critics. When you've got a situation where you have a Trump White House working with a sort of a Netanyahu presidency, mm. 
and then you throw into the mix the, the Hamas leadership, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the prospect for any sort of strategic process in the, in, in the region is, is, you know, is, is... Netanyahu is next, may not be zero. there forever. Israelis want to be Well, he may, not be, to there. Be <laughs> he may not be there for that much longer if... if and yeah. ultimately, there will have to be a solution to it. I don't right. deny the difficulties but of it. But okay. storming the fence is not the solution, is it? No. We'll leave it there. Dan Hodges, thank you for being with us. Now it's late. Count Duckula late. Yes, a bad-tempered brown duck from Number 10's Garden Pond was regarded as the terror of Downing Street. Then, three weeks ago, she laid her eggs outside the cabinet room. Six healthy chicks were hatched, and the glow of motherhood mellowed Team May's fine-feathered friend. If only such heartwarming accord could hatch out among cabinet ministers. But they, of course, are still quackers. Someone who could no doubt teach the Cabinet a thing or two about genteel behaviour is Olivia Bentley from the increasingly divorced from reality programme Made in Chelsea. She'll be putting courtesy under the spotlight. And if you still have nothing better to occupy your lonely late night hours than to bother me with your inane cyber scrawling, then fling, fling your worthless witterings into our Twitter, our Facebook, and our dear old Snap Numpty. They'll be as welcome as the British entry to the Eurovision Song Contest, or the 42 European flags that have been erected off the coast of South End. In other words, not very. The stultifying and a bewildering Brexit process has consigned British politics to a sort of Bermuda Triangle, where rational discourse has vanished, straight answers to simple but vital questions on the future UK-EU relationship are hidden by a fog of obfuscation which has enveloped the Tory and Labour front benches, and political debate, debate and division is now dominated by the arcane differences between the customs union, a customs union, a customs arrangement, and maximum facilitation, or max fact, as they call it. These are matters to warm the cockles of the policy wonks, but which leave 99% of voters bored to tears. So thank goodness for the royal wedding, which offers spectacle, light, relief, humanity, and doesn't involve a customs union. Here's Giles Brandreth having a nice cup of tea and some wedding cake. As you know, here at This Week, we like nothing more than an excuse for a bit of a knees-up. An opportunity for Michael to sing the national anthem accompanied by his ukulele, and Liz to get a bit carried away on a glass or two of the Blue Nun. Well, your royal wedding street party fantasy is my command. <laughs> Even this patriotic wedding fever hasn't persuaded the Ramonas to come out for red, white and blue. Though a certain elusive miniband brother did return to these shores to fly the flag for remaining in the European economic area. The issue at the centre of this week's important vote about the European economic area in the House of Lords are the safe harbour for Britain in a world where we leave the European Union. Great product placement there. Perhaps I should have ordered some rice. At least I've got a scotch egg. Something for Andrew to get his teeth into. And you, little doggy. <laughs> yeah. Best not waste it. <laughs> How about you, Teresa? Fancy a nibble? Oh, no, of course not. You had trouble with our friends from the north this week, didn't you? The Conservatives are isolated and out of touch with the people of Scotland. The Prime Minister respect the will of the Scottish Parliament and work with the Scottish Government to amend the Withdrawal Bill. Yeah. I think it is right that, that we go ahead with measures which not only respect devolution, but also ensure that we maintain the integrity of our common market. Yeah. I know what will cheer us up. A nice game of pin the custom solution onto the EU map. Will it be Max Fack or the PM's preferred solution the cosy customs partnership. Pass me the blindfold. I only feel that's appropriate. I wish Spanish orange growers every success and their oranges make lovely marmalade, and that's all splendid. But I don't think my constituents in northeast Somerset should pay higher prices to protect continental producers. Wake me up. 
I begin by thanking the Foreign Secretary for leading our cross-party efforts over the last two weeks to destroy the Prime Minister's Customs Partnership proposal. Because I seem to remember them campaigning at the last general election on, on a platform to come out uh, of the customs union. They now say they want to stay in a customs union, a customs partnership. We, their policy is absolutely clouded uh, in obscurity. Oh! It's novel because no model like this exists. There have to be significant question marks over the deliverability of it on time. Oh dear, all this Brexit talks a bit of a party pooper. Cheer up. And nothing quite says street party like a little bit of face painting. And this week, Jeremy Corbyn had his little red paintbrush splashing all over the true blue Conservatives when it was announced that the beleaguered East Coast mainline is to be taken under public control. A little bit to the left there, I think. I plan to use a period of operator of last resort control to shape the new partnership. So on the same day, we will start with the launch of the new long-term brand for the East Coast Main Line through the recreation of one of Britain's iconic rail brands, the London and North Eastern Railway, the LNER. I got a feeling that tonight's gonna be a good night. What's this? Malign forces suddenly sabotaging the party. Could it be Russia? MI5 chief Andrew Parker has got me worried. M, is that you? I mean the deliberate, targeted, malign activity intended to undermine our free, open and democratic societies. The chief protagonist amongst these hostile act actors today is the Russian government. Oh, I think that calls for a stiff drink. Barman, can you rustle up something suitable for this week's discerning taste buds? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A joint select committee report into collapsed construction giant Carillion concluded that a cocktail of recklessness, hubris and greed led to the company's demise. The only thing they had they did really well was to stuff their mouths with gold. As far as everything else went, it was thrown to the wind. Oh, blue nun, yes, Michael needs a bit of that. That's why Michael was asked to leave the convent. Come on, shook up. They also called for things with the big four accountancy firms to be shaken up. The warning signs should have been flashing up uh, well before the collapse of the company. KPMG didn't point that out. They have serious questions to answer as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheers. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, Liz, that'll put hair on your chest. Come on, sugar. Oh, nothing worse than a bite of stale donut. And yes, of course, you're Len McCluskey, who thinks that moderate Labour MPs are well past their sell-by date and should now be spat out. And the local party members decide that they don't represent them anymore and use the appropriate procedures, then they should leave and, uh, you know, I won't cry over it. You'd, you'd say good riddance? Good riddance, in a sense, yeah. It's always fun to play happy families, even if the whole family doesn't turn up. Though I don't think the PM and her opposite number will be tucking into the party food together anytime soon. When the Prime Minister wrote at the weekend that she wanted as little friction as possible, <laughs> was she talking about EU trade or the next cabinet meeting? <laughs> Say cheese. If he's talking about friction, perhaps he could reflect on the fact that this month, the Shadow Health Minister in the Lords voted for a second referendum. Oh, that, that at the weekend, the Shadow Brexit Secretary refused to rule out a second referendum. Oh, and on Monday, the Shadow International Development Minister tweeted in favour of a second referendum. Hopefully, the PM can get her whole government lined up for a nice family portrait when the Brexit white paper is released. Our deputy, David Liddington, is uh, keen that the public should bite <laughs> on the final document. I agree, it's a bit of a dog's dinner, isn't it? There's been a huge amount of work that's been going on in different government departments to put flesh on the Prime Minister's vision of a deep and comprehensive special partnership between us and the EU. White paper, 
always useful for those awkward social moments. Which reminds me, I've forgotten the cake. It's a wedding and I've forgotten the cake. I have to make do with this. It's the right royal horlicks. And as you can see, no corgis were hurt in the making of that film. We thank uh, Flat Iron Square in Borough, it's just across the River Thames from here, for hosting Giles' royal wedding shambles. Michael, isn't the government now so paralysed by division, particularly in the Cabinet, and struggling without a Commons majority that it's lost its way on Brexit? I thought it was a rather significant uh, week because I think there's been a big movement on Brexit, which is that the common ground now, or the sort of central ground, is that there's going to be some sort of customs arrangement. Uh, it's going to be pretty close to the customs union. Uh, it's going to last not only through the transition period, but beyond the transition period. That uh, Northern Ireland is, um, I'm sorry to say this, but the, the tail that wags the dog, that this has become the dominant factor. That really the Brexiteers, I think, have lost an enormous loss, uh, an enormous amount of ground. Uh, and it, it's happened over a period, but I think it's become very, very clear in the last week. So actually, I think the, there is a sort of um, policy emerging in the government. Uh, and it is a policy which is jolly close to customs union. So it's Brexit light, you're saying? Uh, yeah, we're heading for a Brexit light. I mean, I've been trying to think what this uh, means. I mean, it means that on the trade side, not much changes. Um, however, that's not all the things that matter. You know, Britain will be making its own laws over a whole range of things. Britain, but can, but, Britain will but, no longer be part of the process of moving towards ever closer European are you, Union. Are you saying that the government will accept a customs arrangement which stops Britain from making its own free trade deals? I, I think that is, uh, is pretty likely. I mean, I know the Prime Minister says on a daily basis that we're going to be le leaving the customs union and that that will put us in a position where we can do our own trade deals. But I don't quite see how that is emerging. I mean, the, 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 the trick that has been given away is that we have to satisfy the European Union on the Northern Ireland border. How we manage to get this way around, I don't know. It should be the European Union that has to make arrangements if it is so keen to avoid the border. But this has become the hinge factor. Mm. And um, as we discussed last week, by the mm. way, both the options that are being discussed within the Cabinet, uh, each of which uh, involves a continuance of many arrangements with the European, neither one of them is thought to be acceptable to the European Union. I wonder if Michael is, r is right on this in, in the hard reality, which is that if the government gives up on free trade agreements, then Mrs May faces a major rebellion from the, the Brexiteers, because for them that is a, that, that, that's a deal breaker for them, and that, that the result would be a kind of parliamentary chaos. I think we may well see that starting from next week. I mean, we hear tonight that the Cabinet has agreed that, um, you know, we'll have the same tariffs even beyond the transition. In reality, actually, there is another issue to stop the border coming, in, a hard border in, in the island of Ireland, which is about regulatory alignment and standards. So the customs issue mm. and the tariffs isn't the only point. If, if that's what they are doing that protects our, uh, our mar uh, the United Kingdom, doesn't have a hard border, I think that is a big step forward. But I think you'll start seeing the Brexiteers rearing their pretty heads in the, in the coming weeks. Pretty heads? Which ones are well, you looking at? I was going to at? say ugly, but I, did, I want to be polite tonight. Well, you are very polite, but we're coming on to politeness later. <laughs> Uh, Jeremy Corbyn said that uh, Mrs May should stand aside and let Labour do the negotiations. Oh. Is there a shred of evidence that Labour is any better prepared? Well, we've been right about the customs union and how important that well, is as part of Well, you don't the... know that because we don't know what Labour means by it. It's not the customs union, by the way. Your party's policy is a customs union. Well, my See view... See what I mean? How we're dancing on the head of a pin now. My view is ah. that staying in the customs union is vital and I'm also very pleased to see the Lords vote uh, for an amendment that we need to have on, on staying in the EEA. Um, 
no doubt there will be huge debates about this, but I very much hope my party will move in that direction because I think the membership of the EEA gives much greater certainty for business and also allows us to have greater controls over immigration too. If you, if you stay in the EEA, for which there's a strong economic case, if you stay in the customs union, for which there's also an economic case, you've not left the European Union. That is your interpretation of well, it. Well, what other possible one is? You're subject to because single market be. rules. You're subject to Brussels trade policy. Uh, you're subject to free well, movement. You're subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court of well, Justice. I you won't be so you haven't left. I, dis I disagree with that analysis. Well, in if what manner are, have you left? Well, if you are a member, you can be in the EEA mm. and not be a member of the EU. You are not under the jurisdiction of the ECJ. Articles 112 and 113 Norway give you greater, is under, Norway greater is effectively controls. under the jurisdiction of the ECJ. No, you're under, the set EFTA, up a parallel court. you're under the EFTA court and you have greater Which, controls over immigration. So I think that F that is a way forward. And the EFTA court, well, first of all, Norway has free movement and you did Schengen. The EFTA the court... the treaty allows you... The treaty allows the, you the to have an emergency break and renegotiate. The EFTA court mirrors the exact jurisprudence of the ECJ. But you are not directly under the ECJ, and if well, you are the facto. UK was part of the EEA, I think, as okay. the Prime Minister of Norway said, it would well. boost their power and influence. So I think that is a solution and a compromise well, it's a, It is a, a solution. It's a solution to staying in, which is what you want to to do, which is fine, uh, many people do. I wonder though if, uh, if actually Brussels isn't more anxious for a deal and that Britain behind the scenes isn't better prepared towards one. Because I, you look what's happening in Italy now, with a Eurosceptic populist government likely to take over. The tensions now between Brussels and the Visegrad group of East European countries are now palpable. Mr. Macron and Mrs. Merkel have yet to agree on what is meant by Eurozone reform. There could be a mood in Brussels. Let's get Brexit out of the way. Let's do the best deal we can with the Brits because we have bigger fish to fry. Well, that was my analysis um, a year ago. I mean, there are a couple of factors that have developed, but you know, most of this was clear a year ago that the European Union had lots of problems and it was silly to try to have extra problems with the exit of the um, United Kingdom. But those advantages and those perspectives um, have not been utilised by the British government. I mean, the British government has operated with maximum weakness. Uh, the civil servants of the British government, I think mainly because they want to stay in the European Union, have convinced the Prime Minister that she has no cards to play. So at no time has she ever played any cards. So I don't see, really, even if they are now you know, a bit bothered about okay. Italy and so on, <laughs> they're just winning every single trick. They're winning hands down. They're winning 10 nil against the United States. Yeah. Let me put this final mm. point to you, Liz. We're running mm -hmm. I mean, you could argue that both government and opposition today are of uncommon mediocrity. Yet between them, the two of them still command 80% of the vote plus <laughs> in the country. At a time mm -hmm. when lots of people think the two main parties are not up to much, we're back to a two-party system. Explain. I think both parties <laughs> are very stretched. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there because that's a great answer. <laughs> Stretched. I often feel it myself. The words outrage and Bank of England don't tend to sit together in many sentences, except when it comes to the bank's inflation forecasts, which are often outrageously wrong. But this week, the bank found itself at the centre of a storm of outrage and sexism when the deputy governor of the bank used the word menopausal to describe the UK economy as sluggish by which he meant, as he helpfully explained, past its productive peak, <laughs> thereby digging an even bigger hole for himself than the one he was already in. It was also the week that Rolling Stone Keith Richards told how he once it was incensed enough to pull out a knife back in the 80s because of the perceived bad manners of a tour promoter who went by the name of a Mr D. Trump. The knife wasn't used. Manners maketh the man, so the proverb goes, and of course, uh, the woman, and naturally various states of gender in between. I mean, you can't be too careful these days, can you? But are they now in short supply? Tonight, we're putting courtesy under the spotlight. <laughs>
Donald Trump isn't known for his courtesy, and this week he appears to have upset the rocket man again. Well, Meghan Markle's sister says that her father has been treated in a highly discourteous manner by the normally gallant tabloid press. I think my father has really suffered at the hands of the media. They, I mean, they've presented him in the most horrible ways. Paul was on hand to defend the honor of British journalism. Piers Morgan responded with his usual delicacy. You're doing a so book I... called The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister. You've been trashing it for two okay. years, you little vulture. But Nanny McVie herself says, if you don't have anything nice to say... Uh, stop it. Just stop it, OK? <laughs> stop doing the, ooh, let's talk about the royal wedding. Okay. MP Hugh Merriman thinks the departing Arsenal manager has been treated discourteously. And it saddened me that the latter years of Arsenal Wenger's reign coincided with the rise of those social media platforms, who I believe were incredibly unfair to him. Meanwhile, a new phrase has emerged to poke fun at that most maligned of groups, middle-aged men. If you voted for Brexit, you're a gammon, says Corbyn spokesman Matt Zarb Cousin. No one's born a gammon. Uh, it does. Uh, it, it results from a series of choices, lifestyle choices, choices about politics, um, and not every red-faced middle-aged man is a gammon. MP Emma Pingeli, who clearly knows a grave injustice when she sees one, says the term is worse than impolite. It's discrimination. Made in Chelsea star Olivia Bentley knows how to mind her P's and Q's. Oh my god, I bet you were like, God, this girl sounds like a maniac. So should we all be a little bit more courteous? <laughs> no one is born a gammon. You don't get words of wisdom like that on news night, do you? Olivia Bentley from Made in Chelsea is here. Do you regard yourself as courteous? Yeah, I think I am. I don't think a lot of people are, but. Do you know what? Do you no. think we're becoming ruder as a society? Yeah, I, th yeah, I think people are. I think they're just a lot of people show a lack of respect for one another, especially through social media. Ah, you think social media has coarsened? Yeah, society. I think it's given people like a platform to give their opinions when in, in real life or face to face, people aren't, aren't as, they wouldn't say a lot of stuff, but they're all like these keyboard warriors who like say this horrific stuff online and then, you know. And, of course, they hide behind anonymity, yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. Whereas if you're face-to-face... -face, yeah, people would never dare say certain things. Not, not anonymous. Are people courteous to you? Depends. When I meet people, they're always like, oh, you're really nice in real life. And I'm like, what do you think I was going to be? <laughs> like, awful. Um, but, yes, yeah, I mean, no-one's ever been rude to me. Because, yeah, I mean, people you're are lucky. quite nice. <laughs> no, but I get it online, like I'm social sure media is horrific. Oh, I, I see. Think. So they attack you online, but yeah. they don't attack you to your no, face. No, no. To my face, people are very sweet. Is it worth being courteous, even to the extent of being a bit two faced? So, in other words, I mean, as I am to these two, <laughs> yeah, I'm quite nice and I can't stand them, basically, but you can't get rid of them either. Is it worth being that, even if just for the sake of being a bit civilized? No, I think if you've got an opinion, I think there's a difference there because there's being respectful but also stating what you think but then there's being rude so you've got to like judge that but I mean obviously it's not right to be two-faced because then you're just chatting rubbish really aren't you what about the uh the the people on Made in Chelsea when when you're off camera are you oh yeah they will just like each other off no but we do that on camera no that's you do that on camera <laughs> and then Is they that watch the it act back? and then are you nice uh, <laughs> off camera no I mean I try and do both obviously it's because you've got to confront situations. Like, if you say something behind someone's back, you don't really have to then go and say it to their face. Oh. But then, obviously, you do on Made in Chelsea. But the dynamic of the show is such that it, it wouldn't work if you were all really nice to each other. Oh, no, you obviously not. It's boring. People wouldn't watch it, really. Do people apologise after and say, I went, I really lost it there, I'm really sorry? Um, no, not really, I don't <laughs> think. <laughs> no. Are we... Um... A less courteous society, Michael? Well, well I, I was just thinking that, you know, as, the, as World War II came to an end, uh, Churchill said that if Labour won the election, that would be a victory for the Gestapo, or worse the effect. Yes. And the Labour Party, I think it was, uh, was it Nye Bevan, who compared the Conservative Party to vermin. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about 1945, uh, and so I'm not sure that that much has, has No, it's changed. a fair point, because these are pretty 
harsh words at the time. But Mr Corbyn spoke of the need for a kinder, gentler politics. How's that worked out? <laughs> I mean, some places not that great. <laughs> you know, there can be... There's far too much anger, hatred, unpleasantness. And uh, actually, the, uh, I've seen it within the Labour Party, but I also really saw it during the referendum, where, which was horrific. Um, I was our not very successful EU champion in the East Midlands, and really people were giving it what for in those debates. What and about Mr Len McClaskey we saw earlier there? Is he being a bit discourteous to you? Because well, you're I obviously say, included I would in what say courteously a moment, you know, a period of silence from Len would be appreciated. Most nastiness in politics happens within a party yeah, rather than between true. parties. Oh, I see, between, yeah. The, and that now is why I wondered about a uh, maid in Chelsea. Do you think these two are courteous? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they seem it. I don't know. Yeah, but, can, you know, appearances can be deceptive, you know. The yeah. thing is, though, is it being... If you're, like, stating an opinion... I don't know, there's a difference, though, isn't there? Of course there, there like, is. There's, like, a fine line. So if you're... You can disagree respectfully. You can disagree respectfully, yeah, without can. being, like, yeah, rude to, the, to people's faces, I think. Well, you've been very courteous to us tonight. You stayed up late to be on this, and we're grateful for that. And you were telling me before we came on air that you're off now the next season of Maiden Chelsea is going to be in Croatia. Croatia. Yeah. Which will be fun. Oh, that's... We, we don't right, even get some. to Scunthorpe, <laughs> never mind Croatia. Um, and the Croatian people are very courteous, so you'll enjoy. Are they? I hope we are to them. <laughs> Good luck with the shooting. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. That's your lot for tonight, folks, but not for us, because Michael, Liz and I are on our way to Lulu's to celebrate and begin the start of the wedding celebrations. We're going to continue all the way to Windsor on Saturday. Now, for some reason, our invitations haven't yet arrived, but I blame that on privatising the Royal Mail. I'm confident that when we get there, we'll see three places, settings with our names on them, carefully arranged between Baby Spice and the Prince of Lesotho. Trump, Obama, the Maybot, they've all been given the cold shoulder, but what wedding would be complete without the This Week talent? We're even bringing our own blue nun. And as a gift for the couple who has everything, two box sets of the daily politics. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't get better than that. Nighty night, don't let Vlad's new truck bite. No need to fake it. Life's no more than what you make it. Keep on working. Keep on trucking till you reach the top. Yeah, keep them wheels rolling. Don't ever let them stop. Tell old bad luck that you ain't buying. You can't fail if you keep trying. Hang on, friend. Keep on trucking. Keep on trucking till you reach the top. Yeah, keep them wheels rolling. Don't ever let them stop. Tell old bad luck that you ain't buying. You can't fail if you keep trying. Hang on, boys. Keep on trucking. I say hang on, gang. Keep on trucking. Britain's kids are being given three times more medicine than we took 40 years ago. When I'm on them, I feel like I don't have control of myself. He's described 